So welcome, everybody. We are so excited to have you here. I am Liz Lemke. I am the Chief Talent Navigator at Transforming Talent, and you all should know me uh, very well by now at the end of this week. And I'm so excited to be joined by my BridgeCon crew um, member, Mehdi. Thank you. Thank you very much, Liz. Um, hi, everyone. Super excited to be here. Super excited to have a Quite a, an interesting, maybe borderline controversial conversation mm. with you, um, Liz, on that topic. Um, my name is Mehdi Tunsi. I manage the EMEA operations for uh, Open Sesame, which is a, a, an e-learning uh, marketplace. But we're here to talk about diversity and inclusion and those conversations around that topic that maybe should happen but are not necessarily happening in the workplace. Precisely, precisely, and it came, and it came from this aspect a couple of weeks ago. Um, and shout out to to Claire Clues if she's in here. Um, I went to a Serenity and Leadership um, session that was about um, what are some of those unseen aspects of um, of diversity and inclusion that oftentimes get ignored because we we talk about race, we talk about gender, we talk about sexual orientation, etc. Um, but it was the discussion about disabilities and this wonderful woman, she um, had unfortunately a, an accident a couple of years ago and she was saying one of the challenges that she finds is that, you know, she has 15 hours where she can do and contribute and wants to contribute, but she's really having a hard time finding an opportunity where she can can be employed and, and doing what she would like to do. and. Um, and as we look to kind of the world of work and reimagining jobs, it's also that aspect of how are we creating more opportunities for a wonderful, so glad to have you here, Claire. Um, love to have you join us also up on stage. Um, so how do we create an opportunity um, for folks because we can, we can just deconstruct jobs and so therefore we can also give different opportunities and and it struck me as you know this is one of those aspects that don't doesn't get talked about quite often um, and so here as we as we in in learning are becoming more closely associated with the topics of DNI and um, and then moving forward from just DNI to then also asking, okay, what is that about equity? What is that about equality? What is that about belonging um, that come into this space? What do we um, have in terms of an imperative to rethink our approach and to say, okay, what are some of the blinders that we have on when we're approaching DNI? Perhaps, oftentimes, I'm just going to say this very loud, out of compliance. Rather than because it's the right thing to do. I, so I, I couldn't agree more with you. I, I think one of the things, so I've been exploring discussion around DNI and learning for, for quite a while because I always felt that learning is should be a great driver to have those conversations and, yeah. you know, essentially to educate people around it. Yeah. Um, and the thing that really annoyed me, is, and I totally agree with you, too often until this day, and, and I see it like day in and day out, People think, oh, it's a compliance issue. It's not. Mm -hmm. It's not a compliance issue. No. It is if you're not having those conversations. It's so you, you mentioned like you know um, issues around like disabilities and being able to have those conversations. And but uh, for me, whether it's like disability, whether it's um, sexual orientation, whether it's um, gender, wh whatever that might be, like, mm -hmm. it seems that people want to do well and therefore they're not prepared to have those conversations. And unless you have those conversations, we can't really understand. Okay. Why is it that you know maybe I'm bringing to the plate quite a set of uh, you know prejudices towards mm -hmm. whatever it is, and unless I have a conversation, I'm not going to be educated, and I'm not going to change my behaviour towards that because I'm not going to be in a position to understand it. And, and I think like, to that extent, it would be great for you mm -hmm. to like, share with the audience just the conversation we had like backstage. That sounds yeah. so good to be able to say I was backstage. <laughs> Probably the only time I've ever been yeah, backstage, if so I must be honest. Um, but about what's been happening in the news at the moment. Mm. Yes, exactly. So I actually ironically got in my feed today that the um, CEO of KLM um, was just fired from the board. Um, he had been making some comments to some consultants that um, unconscious bias training was 
see dot 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 um, <laughs> um, and that it didn't bring anything and it didn't change any behaviors. Um, he I would, also had some other things that uh, um, about his employees that, you know, they shouldn't be complaining due to Corona and the, the working conditions. But really what was one of the real cornerstones for why he was let go was this aspect of him really saying, OK, unconscious bias training is expensive and it has no value in terms of behavior change. Uh, uh, so uh, if I may add to that, and uh, mm. I don't want to fall into like a political discussion, but I just happened to live in the UK and, and in London. And we had that literally a couple of months ago where a, an MP refused to take on an unconscious bias training um, with the excuse that I already know my constituents, so I don't need any unconscious bias, which in itself is, you know, proof, you know, say, really, maybe I should review because if I'm always with the same people, with the mm -hmm. same ideas and the same appreciation of life, clearly I have a bias and uh, the only way to address that would be maybe for me to go through an unconscious lot and training bias. But on, on that topic, Liz, and I'm quite interested in like, hearing your opinion and you know anyone else joining us today, yeah. please feel free to drop in your views uh, on that um, specific subject. Why do you think that there's so many times we see people considering unconscious bias, which really should be the, the base, as being something that is not required or is nonsensical? <laughs> I think this is really that aspect of, you know, do people consider themselves, you know, is it, what is it around privilege that, you know, you don't have to take your time to look at it. And so it, it really does surprise me this, this kind of belief that we are all in these little bubbles. Um, because as we look to, you can't, of course, we know you can't get rid of bias. I mean, that's, of course not. It's it's about, you know, how do you have awareness? Um, Joanne Lockwood talks about, you know, how do you migrate bias? You know, I know that we had a lot of discussions as to this love, see, no color. Well, that's not what we want. Our colors are what make us wonderful. How do we create a space and um, how do we create environments where people, where it's brave that, so that you can be yourself, you don't have to switch codes depending upon where you are, um, and that you can show up with yourself, that you can add on to other people's ideas, that you can have your own opinion and that it's not um, this please, you know, someone said it so nicely, culture fit feels like a straight jacket. <laughs> um, so here, how, you know, this, this aspect of how are we seeing those different colors and how, and that all, that, that only adds to the richness of the conversation of the perspectives, et cetera. And so the idea to opt out of, um, of being able to see the, the plurality is a very, very bizarre even approach because um you know even a and i'll just put this out there even a 60 year old man um can you know be people can use ageism against them so it's it's really interesting to say okay at what point do people believe okay um i do need to have an awareness or i can really truly opt out of um having an awareness of the people around me I, I was going to say, and, and mm. you know, I, I, I'm sorry if that sounds like it's name dropping, but it's I have very little education. But I saw a really good TED mm. talk by um, Melody Hobson, and she was talking about um, colorblind oh. versus color brave, mm. and I think that's really about you know that have being brave enough to say, and admitting you know I do not know, and maybe because I see things through my filter, mm -hmm. I'm missing things, and and again those comments, and then I think that's the thing that is highly frustrated for me is too often the dominant group within a company but really essentially it could be society as well yeah. will have that you know assumption that they know it better and therefore i know on the behalf of those other groups what's best mm -hmm. for them which is what well, which is not how we you know we advance that conversation which is not how we get to you know address those issues yeah well and you know, and I think that that's, it's, um, it reminds me of like Tim Ferriss, where he says, you know, do a small experiment where you act outside of the norm. So for example, go into a Starbucks and just sit down or lay down on the floor and then see what happens. And just to kind of create this sense of when you are not in that norm group, when you're not behaving according to what everybody else expects people to behave, um, 
how does that feel? How does, what is that perception in terms of your own um, looking around of what's going on to create a broader awareness around what it feels like to not do anything else than just be yourself to be con be looked at and evaluated through a different lens. And then actually, Liz, I have to ask, did, did you pick up um, Starbucks on purpose because of what happened <laughs> with Starbucks not so long ago for customers that did absolutely nothing wrong? <laughs> Sorry, that was an inside joke. <laughs> But uh, it, it, you, you, I think you're spot on, and, and I think that's you know where the issue, especially in, in the workplace. Uh, um, it, so it, it's well, funny, not funny, I guess. But mm. I have um, I have a young um, teen daughter that um, today came to me because she was an, having an argument with one of her classmates around, like, um, like telling her, like, "Oh, you're wrong. You should not be supporting LGBTQ, supporting everyone. It doesn't matter." You know the group. It's if you want to f fair and live in a, in a society that is fair. It's not about whether or not I would you know agree with uh, you know their preferences. It's about if everyone is being supported fairly, then mm -hmm. we can. And I, and I was amazed that at twelve years old, she's got the maturity to be able to understand that. Well, actually, no. I will be defending. It's not because I necessarily agree or not with the ideas. It's because what is right is to allow everyone to be. And yeah. I cannot under the pretext that my ideas are different, push that. And I'm thinking, if at 12 years old they can have that, that kind of you know, maturity, what is it that in the workplace, it seems we, you know, we're missing out on that and we're not able to have the conversations or the, the education really essentially for people to understand that whatever opinions I have and what have you, there is a place and a time to share them. But in the workplace, I should not put people at an ease or, or I should create a or foster an environment of psychological safety to a certain extent mm -hmm. for people to be feel at ease to be whoever they are and with whatever that is so that you know everyone can well, essentially get on with their day well to get on with their day in terms of you know here belonging and what i like about you know and, and expanding the you know diversity is oftentimes about compliance and that's also the discussion going on here in the chat and then we're talking about inclusion it's okay are we creating a space um, where people can feel included and be included, question mark. And so I think that's why it's also getting expanded to this aspect of belonging, because I think belonging is quite interesting. Um, I'm going to be talking about that later when I'm when I'm going into working remotely and being connected, this aspect of belonging. You know, you can belong to a family. You don't necessarily always get along with your own Gershmo, but you know, you still belong to the family. And, and it's that self-explanatory of you can be who you are within this, within this space and within this realm. And I think that, you know, as we look to many organizations, um, there's a there's a good discussion going on here about, you know, cultural competency and, you know, culture fit is something that gives me personally hives. I am a culture psychologist. So um, here this piece around um, a simulation and just because you're there, you need to have the main common culture. And my work, particularly within MA, was always to say there was a reason why we're merging with you. So how do we find, you know, what is the best things about what it's like to work here and how can we bring it together and create a new combined um, path forward that is very inclusive and celebrates what are the great things that we're bringing together rather than feeling like oh well you know you're the majority shareholder plop you guys all have to suddenly adjust to our company culture etc so I think this is that aspect of people oftentimes kind of misunderstanding um, what it means perhaps to have constructive conversations about something and then oftentimes it going to perhaps normative things like oh Medi has a beard liz has gray hair you know um no, she hasn't <laughs> exactly. i just have really really light highlights um <laughs> <laughs> that get in the way of saying, okay, how are we having some good constructive conversations and getting those different opinions out onto the table that we are actually listening. So, um, and not just listen, necessarily just speaking, just to hear ourselves speak. How are we really creating that space so that other voices have an opportunity to be heard? I, I'm, I have to, I mean, 
I'll come back to you more, but I love that the whole idea around like that sense of belonging mm. and it, how it's, I mean, especially in this day and age, I suppose, um, where there's far more technology like, to, in theory, get us more connected. Mm. You're totally right. People are, are, you know, there's feel probably more loss and especially in, in regards to our like, diversity, but even not to, I mean, you think company culture or organizational culture, the, the diversity fits into that because I want to fit in, I want to belong. Mm -hmm. But if I'm not being felt belong because, and it more often than not, it's out of ignorance because people do not understand what is it I, I believe in, what is it um, I prefer, mm -hmm. what I look like, and 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 also and, and and I think that that's the, and I think that's where we need to have more hard conversations. I think that's where mm -hmm. people should be. And I had a, and I'll give you an example. I had a conversation like a few days ago with someone that was very interesting. They was they were telling me that. We're talking about racism and you know our own experiences of um, racism, and and she was telling me she had the same experience with uh, someone trying to do well, and in order to prove that they were um, not a generous, they asked me, "So what do you think about the Me Too issue?" And, and, and so she felt invaded in her mm -hmm. privacy because you can't. I mean, you know, in the same way, and, and I would be asked often. So you know, so. Where do you come from? Like in our child, oh, yeah. I was born in France. And, no, but where do you come from? It's like, you mean the city? Like, you, how well do you know? And people, because there's that, no, but you know, and I said, I know that it just. Yeah, and, yeah, absolutely. And and I love I love pushing people to like those, you know, boundaries. Let's mm -hmm. have that conversation because what? What is it that, you know, you might think or you might know that, you know, makes you doubt or, or question where I am from, what would I lie about, you know, where I am from or who am I and what does that, what doesn't that put you at ease? What is it that is, you know, preventing you? It, so mm -hmm. to a certain extent, and it, that might be a controversial idea, but I think if, in regards to diversity, if you belong, belong to a group that is not the majority group, and um, maybe you should actually go and like, push for those conversations to happen. Mm -hmm. Because I think more often than not, the dominant group in terms of, of, of size that is will either not engage fully or wanting to do too well will with i mean you know when you're too polite you essentially you're not achieving anything because you're not having those conversations you're not going towards the other person or you're trying not put rules that you think oh i'm doing well well in fact mm -hmm. well you're not doing well you probably are either making like, the situation worse or ostracizing that other group by trying to, oh, we've done that. So you mentioned uh, um, that colleague of yours. So, you know, it would be the same as, oh, we're doing that activity. I don't just for argument. We're doing paintball. We wanted to invite you, but we thought because, and I think people should have those conversations. And I think mm -hmm. maybe we should uh, reverse the roles. And, you know, if you belong to, like, you know, a group where diversity, I mean, you know, a minority in terms of diversity, you should go and have those conversations and say, guys, you know, feel free and ask me or, you know, I don't know if it's joining an ERG, and, and I have my own opinion on ERGs. But um, we need to trigger that. Like that, you know, that needs to happen one way or another, because otherwise, the state quo is not achieving anything. Well, and I think that that's an important. So, two things to just that. You know, here are the assumptions being made about me because I represent something that people associate. So for example, I'm an American in Germany, so I've had to do a lot of explaining about the last four years. I'll just I'll just put that nice little blanket statement, okay? Um, and it's that piece that, you know, because you are from a particular group, et cetera, you need to represent everything, even though, for example, you know, here, you know, you could probably explain Lyon or some other city in France much better than other things. Um, and it's that piece to say out of that politeness, starting a conversation, but then also putting in a box without giving you that opportunity. So it, it's saying, okay, how do I you know, as a person who is in the minority within this particular case, take that to say, okay, is this person, you know, wanting to understand having a real conversation? Or are they hoping that I will fit into that box that they've nicely prepared for me? Um, um, and some of the other things is, you know, um, it's also very exhausting. And mm -hmm. I don't We've talked about this to to be always having to explain justify yeah, and explain yourself 
<laughs> and it, there was a really great article that I, I'll share there. Um, it, it came out um, a couple of months ago about the psychological strain it, it is to constantly have to explain racism or um, that goes on because it's a lot of emotional work because there is, because you're trying to find the words. How do you deal with that perceived you know, that real threat of, okay, I need to, I need to counterbalance, I need to represent everyone from this group so that we can have a positive experience and talk about it as a level that is constructive, when sometimes you just want to be, you know, and so this is that, that aspect that oftentimes doesn't get talked about is, that's, the piece of belonging where you're self-explanatory there. And yes, we do, when when we are representing a minority, we have a responsibility that's been placed upon us in kind of a sandwich position to be that, that buffer um, for understanding. But it's also, and this came in here, it says, you know, also who's doing the explaining and what is the context of, you know, how are you having the conversation? Um, and, you know, we talk about mansplaining, but there's, you know, it, <laughs> it happens within these other contexts as well. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I, I totally agree, and which is why, earlier on, I've mentioned, um, and, and I said, because we're going through that journey within our organization, and, mm. and I've seen the ERGs being created, and I, I was slightly on the fence with that, mm -hmm. because I think it's good that we have ERGs and, you know, people can... On one hand, I feel that they're part of a group that would be communicating about you know where you know where they stand, and but at the same time, maybe we're creating more silos. Yeah, and I, then there's that risk that you know then the conversation is not happening, and it's each to their own. And then you know when you, it comes back to that sense of belonging, the risk is oh, I'm belonging to that group. So yeah. by default, does that mean that you know I'm not part of the the bigger group and, and missing something there? I'm completely with you. I went to a HR director's um, summit in Amsterdam. And one of the strangest things that I felt, I felt like we were talking about different zoos. And it was, and then they were talking that, you know, oddly the retention rate wasn't higher. And it was, well, if I'm a token and if I don't feel like I belong and if it, you know, if I don't feel like, okay, what is my progression or this is really just out of a compliance, that's not it. So it's really, you know, I, I, I agree that again, that's one of those unspoken aspects out of diversity and inclusion that has become fairly commonplace, but we need to question, you know, here, um, yes, how are we creating a sense of safety and a sense of space so that there is strength and unity in the group, but how do we not ostracize even more based upon that. And because we are so much more than our normative um, aspects of who we are, we're, we're, you know, that we're, <laughs> we all have multifacets. And so how are we uh, understanding that space of who we are and how we are within that is really key and important. So we just wanted to kick off this discussion here today. And by no means um, are we any way, um, the, the be all end alls. Oh, no us it's really how do we start to go into those brave spaces of having discussions putting things out um not trying to be oracles of truth but one of the things is having the conversation also gives opening an opening up to say okay and what are the things that we can do um, to make things better so that people can thrive. And so this comes back to that aspect of as we look to how we redesign work, as we look to how we're collaborating between and within teams, what are the things that we can do to create those safe, honest spaces so that people can can thrive with the work that they're doing and the people that they're doing the work with? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Do, um, I'm, I'm, so I, I said that sometimes you're able to like, see the comments. I'm not able to see any comments because I'm that smart. So, <laughs> <laughs> so would you would you I kindly just it up, yeah? Would you humor us and not just let us know what, what comments we're getting or what people are saying? Because I'm very interested in again, it's about sharing, and you know, uh, certainly don't feel that I have any knowledge so, or expertise. Yeah is one of the things is this aspect so here what are the microaggressions and it's very hard when we're only able to to talk in chat to deal with those microaggressions mm -hmm. 
think that's a very important aspect to say, okay, here, how are we having the opportunity? You know, people do feel safer, you know, it's that I don't want to say um, here and it shouldn't always be that oh, those who are black are brown to talk about racism. Yeah. Um, we whites need to explore our own privileges and educate ourselves on racism so that order around us can combat racism in the systems that perpetuate white supremacist behavior and practices in everyday life. So well said. Absolutely. Jamaican heritage. And I was absolutely astounded about how marginalized our mixed race children are because they're not considered to be black enough to fit into the black community. Yes. Yeah, it, 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 it's funny. I, my background is, is North African and I had that same thing. Growing mm -hmm. up, whenever I would go and visit um, my parents' family, I'd be considered like an immigrant like, and I'd be called white. But then I'd go back to France and I'd be called, oh, no, you're North African. You don't belong. So it, it, it's, it, it's an interesting one when you're in between the two and trying to identify I and mean, find your identity. And, and then I suppose... When you come into the workplace, and this has been my experience, to I think to the, a lot of my colleagues, I'm French because I complain all the time, and I'm always of the opposite opinion. So that you know, there's a lot of that that falls into. Let's fall into the cliches. But I've had, you know, I've, in my professional experience, I had um, I worked in Chile for a while, and I remember the, the and I worked for a German company, and the the, the partner I had in Chile. I remember him first time we met questioning thing, but you work for the Germans and it was myself and one of my colleagues who's of Indian descent. And we got into the meeting and said, but I, I did not expect you guys. And I said, what do you mean? You did not? Well, you know, you work for a German company. So <laughs> yes. And, and it was an interesting conversation because, you know, and I think it's important to be able to put it out there and say, well, you know, we live in a, it's a global village. It's not, it's a global village, absolutely, and and it's it's a global village, and it's an opportunity to understand, and that there are different ways to get to Rome, and that there are so many things that are on a continuum. Just because you also come from a particular culture group or a cultural heritage, you know, it's quite always quite interesting. We see our own groups as quite pluralistic and having a large continuum, and then it's very odd when there's a look at a particular group, etc. That there's, you know, it's all of a sudden it's like shrink wrap, <laughs> um, and it's. And it, the challenge there is really is that I, upon face value, cannot go into a conversation without getting through this barrier first. Mm -hmm. So um, Mehdi and I will be so um, continuing this discussion. This is something that we want to do as partners just to kind of say, let's let's continue here because it's important um, if people are having these questions and needing this space to discuss, how can we create those safe and brave spaces um, and what is our role within learning uh, to really help foster that? Yeah, and if I may add, at least, it, um, so I hope people would reach out, but I'm very, very interested in working for a U.S. company. I, I've had to, you know, have quite a few conversations around my colleagues saying, well, the way you perceive DNI is a completely different ball game in Europe. And, 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 and again, mm -hmm. because there's a different history, there's a, so I, uh, Anyone who wants to chip in that conversation in terms of, of a, how do we define or do we need to define DNI as being a yeah. different thing if I'm US based versus Europe, you know, Europe based mm -hmm. and what goes into it and, you know, how much knowledge do we need to bring to the table to be able to, you know, advance on those topics and make sure that it's not one thing that, again, will be falling back into it's a compliance. I've done my tick. Everyone received that thing. They've seen the, that course. They know that, oh, it's bad. You can't say that. But we all know that who's going to get that promotion and you know whatever that is. And so really interesting having those discussions. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And I appreciate, so Claire, my, our, <laughs> one of our inspirations um, um, clarified. So here, so there must be a category then for disablism because I'm not disabled enough to fit into the severe disabled groups, but I'm not well enough to be able to work full time like I used to. So well said. And this this aspect of what is ableism. So I, I look forward to continuing this discussion again. We just really want to be an open, safe forum to, to say, okay, how do we deal with this? Because shoving it under the rug and not discussing it 
it makes it worse. Yeah. Yeah. Totally agree. So thank you so much, everyone, for your comments. Um, to be continued. And if you'd like to join us, let either Mehdi or I know. And we look forward to having you there. So with that, thank you so much. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Big shout out. And uh, lots of love all in this room. Um, so appreciate that you are here and together with us on this journey. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.